Good morning. So I just want to um, remind you, and I know that you know, but it's always good to talk about it, and it always makes God smile when we realize what a precious treasure we are to Him. And so Webster defines treasure as accumulation or hidden wealth such as jewels or money. Often regarded especially valuable to greatly cherish, to hold dear, to keep fondly in mind, a depository or a storehouse. And so these are ways that God has a special love for us and He sees you as a special treasure. And we don't always see ourselves that way. We're kind of negative, and so God has to keep coming along and continuing to tell us that we are precious to Him. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, actually verse 6, says, For God said, Let light shine out of darkness. He made His light to shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay that show this all-surpassing powers from God and not from us. So we know it's not from us. And I'm always interested in the jars of clay because, you know, jars of clay, if you even look at them, they fall apart practically. And yet God puts the greatest treasure that he has, the gospel, into us whom he says you're like jars of clay. Why? To show God's power, and it's not us. So, it were but earthen vessels, things of little or no worth of value, and the treasure of the gospel light and grace is put into earthen vessels. The ministers of the gospel are weak and frail creatures, we all know that, don't we? And subject to like passions and infirmities as other men. They're mortal and soon broken into pieces. Yet God puts this treasure of the gospel into these kinds of people, ministers of the gospel. And we're all ministers of the gospel. That's not just the pastor, that's you too. So he knows that we're weak, frail, and subject to passions and infirmities. And so that God is so ordered that the weaker vessel, the weaker the vessels are, the stronger his power may appear to be. So if you think you're just weak and you're little and you're nothing, God says, that's exactly what I'm looking for. The one who can recognize that. The treasure itself is what is to be valued, not the vessel. It's like looking at a, a beautiful plant, vision, a beautiful plant, huge flower, just magnificent, and you just look at it and you just go, oh my gosh, that is the prettiest thing I've ever seen. But the tendency that we have is not to look at the flower, but to say, wow, look at that clay pot. And so God's wanting you to say, I want you to see what's in it, not what it is. So there's an excellency of power in the gospel of Christ to enlighten the mind, to convince the conscience, to convert the soul, to rejoice the heart. But all this power is from God, the author, and not from men who are but instruments, so that God in all things must be glorified. So God uses the weak so he can put his power into it. And he says, the weaker the vessel declares itself, the greater my power is in that vessel. In Isaiah 62, 3, he says, You will be crowned with splendor of the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. That's how God sees you. We think of diadems, you know, they're kind of like a pole. And then they had all these jewels on the top of it. And God said, you're the jewels on the top of it. The Lord their God, in Zechariah, he says, The Lord their God will save them on that day as the flock of his people. They will sparkle in his land like jewels in a crown. How attractive and beautiful they will be. Who's God talking about? God's talking about you. You. You say, me, little old me. Yes, this is who God's talking about. Because we're the flock of his people. And when he gets done with us, we're going to be like 
beautiful jewels. In the love that he has for them and the relation wherein they stand to him, that they are the flock of his people and he is their shepherd. Never forget that he is your shepherd, and he's a very conscientious, careful shepherd. But sometimes we forget that we're part of his flock, and we want to go running off to do this or running off to do that and not staying close to the shepherd. And he's saying, you're so important to me. Stay close to me. Let me be your shepherd all the time, all the time. And they are to him, you, they, they meaning you, they are to him as stones of a crown, which are very precious and of great value, which are kept under strong guard. He's still talking about you. Beautiful stones, very precious, of great value, which are kept under strong guard. And you say, well, where's the strong guard? I haven't seen any guards around here. You know, well, you have the Holy Spirit guarding you. You have the Word guarding you. He says that we're garrisoned about, so we're protected. You have angels guarding you, why? Protecting the stones that are so important to God. And never was any king so pleased with the jewels of his crown as God is and will be with his people who are near and dear to him and who he glories. God is anxiously waiting for the time that we're with him. And we say, come, Lord, we want to be with you. And God saying, I want you there, but it's not quite time yet. Not quite time. So you just keep sparkling right where you're at now. So they're the crown, they, again, that is you, that is me, the crown of glory and the royal diadem in his hand. So when we think about kings and queens that we've seen on TV and they hold their diadem, they got a big old crown on that they can't hardly keep their head straight, he says, that's what you are to God. They shall be lifted up and an ensign upon his land, and the royal standard is displayed in a token of triumph and joy. The royal standard. God's people are his glory. But let's get a little more personal than that. You are part of his glory because you are part of God's people. God wants you to see that that's how he sees you. Whether you see yourself that way or not, and most of us don't, we put ourselves down, which is kind of an offense to God because he says that's who you are. So don't argue with God. He really hates that. So he says you're going to be his glory. He sets them up as a banner on his own land. And we look around and we're, we're flag crazy right now. Have you noticed? Everybody's got some kind of a flag flying and some of them are beautiful and some of them are really not very nice. They set up a banner. And what does that banner say? That banner says what's in their heart, what's important to them. So he sets you, his people, up as a banner upon his own land, waging war against those who hate him, to whom it is a flag of defiance. Jesus is a flag of defiance. You are a flag of defiance. And we say, what do you mean by that? Because we're not going to do what everybody else does. We're going to defy what is common. We're going to defy what is the latest thing right now. We're going to stay in gospel mode. We're going to stay as the people of God. We're going to hold the standard. We're going to hold the line. We're going to hold the word. And so you become that banner for God over the land. So God makes promises. He's, he makes, he's got tons of promises. And so one of the promises is Isaiah 46.4. Even to your old age and gray hairs. Yay, I'm glad for that. I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you. I will carry you. I will sustain you. I will rescue thee. That's some pretty good promises, isn't it? Going to carry you, sustain you and rescue you even to your old age. 
So gray hairs were here and there upon them. The people had, we've always had people with gray hair, but God will not cast them off. Sometimes cultures begin to think that gray hair, you're kind of done, you know, you're over the hill, you're gonna, when are you gonna retire? And then there's even cultures that when they're older people, they just put them on an ice flow and send them out and, and they're done with them. But God says in his promise that he will not cast them off. He will not fail them after their strength fails. He is still their God and will still carry them in the same everlasting arms. So you don't have to be young and healthy and, and on the go all the time. God says when you get to that place that you can't carry you, he will carry you. And that's a really great promise. That's a great promise. And it's yours. He has made them and owns his interest in them. And therefore, he will bear them. God says, I made you. I'm going to take care of you. I made you. You belong to me. I created you. You're my creation. I bought you back. I paid for you. I sent my son to die for you. That's how important you are to me. And so when you get into the place that you think you don't have any value or you think you don't have any worth or you think you're too old or you think you're done or you think your time's up or whatever, just remember this verse that he says, I will bear you with infirmities and bear you up under your afflictions. Even I will carry and deliver them. That is God's promise. So when you're encompassed with infirmities, I am he, uh, that I am, the I am, the great I am. He that I have been, the very same by whom you have been born from and carried from the womb. So I was there all the time watching over you, taking care of you, guarding you. You change, but I'm the same. I am he that I promise to be. And God says, you know, I make these promises. They will always be there. The promise is good because I made the promise and nothing is going to change that. You can count on it. So no matter what part of life you're in, the promise is yours. And when you get to that place that you worry about your age and all of that, remember this promise. This promise is yours. God says, I'm not going to let you down. I am not the world. I am God. I do it way different. So I will carry you, bear you, bear you up, bear you out, and carry you in your way and carry you home at last. That's going to be a really good day. God carries us home, isn't it? So in Exodus 19, it says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. God's treasured possession. We all have possessions that we treasure. We have little things that are really important to us. And, and one that I have is always kind of a funny one. It's in a little tiny blue box, but inside of it is a ugly old necklace with a cross on it that a part of it is gone. And why do I treasure that? Because when my son was about five years old, he found this necklace and he came and he gave it to me and he wanted me to have it. Is a necklace a treasure? Not particularly. It's kind of ugly. It's all grimy and kind of faded and discolored. But it's the one who brought it that made it a treasure. And so God says, I'm the one. So I make you my treasure. You are my treasure. And we say, well, that's not much of a treasure. And God said, it's the one I was willing to die for. So that ups the ante on the treasure, doesn't it? And although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
As a people dear to him, you shall be a peculiar treasure. I want you to take this personal. When he says you, I want you to say, that's me. He's talking about me. He's talking about me. We have the idea of generally. Well, yeah, God says that about everybody. But in this message, I want you to get a hold of, he's talking about you. Take it personal because this is great promise. And how God sees you, he wants you to see you how he sees you. Because then you understand how dear you are to him. How precious you are to him. So he says, as a dear people, you should be a peculiar treasure. Well, we're peculiar, all right, aren't we? But he says it's a different kind of treasure, not the treasure that men would count as treasure. Not that God was enriched by them as a man is by his treasure, but he was pleased, get a hold of that word, he was pleased to value and esteem them as a man does his treasure. God is pleased to value you. He's pleased to esteem you. He loves doing that. He doesn't have to. He desires to. That's his heart. They were precious in his sight and honorable, and he set his love upon them, and he took them under his special care and protection as a treasure that's kept under lock and key. Special treasure. You are a special treasure. And if today you're not feeling like a special treasure, then you're either going to believe God's word or you're not going to believe God's word. But I would encourage you to say, okay, if that's what God says about me, then I'm going to be in agreement with God. That's always the best position anyway, to be in agreement with God. And this treasure is kept under lock and key. There's only so much that God will allow into your life. There are limitations that he's put on Satan that he can do in your life. Why? Because he has a lock and key that Satan can only go so far and then the gate is locked into your life. That's how big a treasure that you are to him. You're precious in his sight and honorable. So he set his love upon you. He took you under his special care and protection as a treasure that's kept under lock and key. Let this sink into your heart and spirit. This is what God says about you. And believe God. Don't be an unbelieving believer. Now, I, I say that to Christians who don't believe that's really about them. It must be talking about so-and-so. They would be really special to God. I'm not really special like they are. That is a lie. So stop telling lies. You say, this is what God says. You know, I, it's hard to understand, but that's what he says. So by giving them divine revelation, instituted ordinances and promises, including eternal life, sending prophets among them, pouring out his spirit upon them, he distinguished them from and dignified them above all people, a special people. He made you part of a special people, took you out and said, this is my special people. And this honor have all the saints. They are, under God, they are God's peculiar people when he takes up his jewels. And so God has these jewels scattered all over. And when he gets ready, he's going to start gathering up his jewels. And that's going to make up his crown. These jewels are you. He's going to gather his people. And when he gathers his people, he's going to make a crown. And it's going to be the most beautiful thing that ever happened. Isn't that amazing? I hope you're feeling like you're loved by God. I hope you're thinking, stop thinking negative thoughts and start saying, if God said it, then that's what it is. That's, that's truth. In Deuteronomy 7, 6, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you. You, yes, little o you, yes, not important you, yes, nobody you, yes, you're the one he chose. On the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. And I want you just to say to yourself right now, I am God's treasured possession. Doesn't matter how I feel about it. This is truth, and I'm going to speak truth, because God said so. In Malachi 3.16, Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, 
And the Lord listened and heard, and a scroll <coughs> excuse me, of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them as in compassion as a man spares his son who serves him. God's got his eye on you. God's watching over you. God's all ready to take care of you. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. People that recognize that they're a treasure in God's hand, you're going to serve God different. If you just think you're nothing to God and God doesn't care, that's wicked. It's wicked because it's not right about God. You're not telling truth about God. And so gather in, you know, and you might as well take the good part. Okay, when God gathers up his jewels, I'm going to be one of them. Yes. And then in Revelation 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. That is good news, isn't it? We look forward to that. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Of course they are. God said them. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give a drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this. I will be his God and he will be my son. This is God's declaration. He's de declarating it in the end. He's doing it now. He's saying right now, I'm your God. You're my son. I'm your God. You're my son. Right now, we need to get a hold of that, that we truly, truly belong to God. We don't wait until we get to heaven to belong to God. We belong to God now, and God says we're precious treasure to him, and he loves you dearly, loves you dearly, and will carry you when you need to be carried, encourage you when you need to be encouraged, because he is your God, he is your shepherd, and we want to proclaim I am of the people of God, that my God is a great God. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you say these things to us, bring encouragement into our heart that we belong to you, that you have not left us. You won't leave us. You will be there to the ends of our lives, no matter how long they are, but that you see us so different than we see ourselves. You see us as precious treasure. You see us as under lock and key. You see us as a time that you're anxiously waiting to draw all your people to you, a time when we will all be with you and spend time with you, and there will be no more pain, there will be no more sorrow or crying. But Father, we want to live that way now. We want to live like we belong to the great Almighty God, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.